It's the Toranga Pū Show with Tāmati, Eru and Muki on Te Upoko o Te Ika. So why are you here? We're here today. I'm a mother. I have two little children. Um, I think most of the mothers in this are concerned about their children's free press. Um, basically, we have a situation where a few years ago, when Iraq war was called out with lies, the weapons of mass destruction, we had a full media discussion about it in all the mainstream media. But right now, we have not got that situation with exactly the same scenario, only for Syria. And I'm really concerned. The OPCW is the watchdog for chemical weapons um, from the UN. And basically, the, the results from the whistleblowing, which is numerous whistleblowers and scientists within that organisation, said the US have been forcing them to give a, an inaccurate report about Assad chemical weapon attack of his own people in Douma last year and the same concerns are held about the previous year's chemical attack and now there's a link between them and the white helmets and the thing that really disgusts me the most I mean we've got white helmets winning an Oscar we have white helmets being funded by our tax paying dollars we have the New Zealand fire brigade training them these people are implicated in the deaths of 40 people in possibly a gas chamber and then they place the men women and children on the site in Duma and then use those photos to justify bombing of Syria. This is exactly the same as Iraq but we're not hearing anything about that and that is basically what, what it all boils down to. We are not being given the information that we need to have to make good informed decisions with facts anymore and um, that is a deep concern. If I have to hand that to my children, if I have to leave it to them to sort out, we will have already stepped off the cliff and we will already have gone too far and it will be very hard to climb our way back up out of that. Um, really upsets me how little the journalists in this country have even covered things like Nikki Hager who got 1,200 journalists including Chris Hedges, John Pilger, Noam Chomsky, Daniel Ellsberg, the Pentagon Papers. You know, we, we have the most amazing journalists in the world all standing up. We have 100 doctors saying that he's going to die in custody in Britain if we're not careful. Um, we've got lawyers now signing up open statements saying this this is not legal. We are breaking in war, like international laws that were set down, laid down in the World War. So really major concerns and really, really horrified by the lack of knowledge in the population. What's great though is when I talk to them, they are on board straight away. I mean, aside from the odd maybe military sort of orientated person, we've really not had any trouble convincing people with our facts. So I, I know that in the end of the day the truth will come out. And what's really intriguing is, I, I'm a little mum from Island Bay, I mean I'm an architect, but really I don't have any experience whatsoever in this. I have no idea what I'm doing. But I've managed to instigate a protest today in 34 cities. 34 cities, and I can't, I can't even get Radio New Zealand or anyone to report on this. Isn't that a feel-good Kiwi story that we're kind of missing? These people are really brave, and everyone else who's been sitting on their butts are actually putting all of us, including themselves, in danger, inevitably. Alex, you've made some uh, allegations there. That um, is there proof? Yep. of the things that you've said? Yeah, so the OPCW is a leak that happened a month ago um, via WikiLeaks. Now, we know that WikiLeaks have released 13 years worth of truthful, factual documents. Not a single one has been discredited. They've never had to retract a single statement. In addition, the Pentagon had to admit in court that no one has ever been harmed by the release of the Afghan war you know, papers. And in fact, the only um, blatant release of information was done by The Guardian. And, and they have an article at the moment about Manafort and one I think about Farage, which are proven with facts to be completely, completely inaccurate, and yet they won't reject it. And everyone is calling for that, Glenn Greenwald, John Pilger, all the big names are calling for that, and they're not. So if you look at OPCW, the White Helmets are named in that report, they're not sure, but the thing is the White Helmets are always there to film the beheadings, taking car carcasses off that have just been 
persecuted by ISIS people. You know, they are embedded in there. Um, they have been fully discredited. There is absolutely no doubt that they are not what they are dressed up to be. Whether or not they are the ones who did that, but someone did, and it wasn't Assad. <laughs> so that much is true from technical evidence, from engineers. Um, it's true from people who have analysed the chlorine, which was actually no higher than background levels of chlorine that you'd normally expect to see. Yeah, so those those are facts. The white helmet is a um, is an allegation, but it's a well-founded one that's in an OPCW report, so it's well worth looking at it. And just to explain to our listeners and our viewers who the white helmets are. So the white helmets won an Oscar. Um, I think George Clooney did a film with them. Um, they have been funded very heavily by uh, UK, France, and England, particularly, but also all the Five Eyes countries. Um, what they have been exposed to be doing is to be setting up propaganda images, sort of like the ambulance with the little boy with the white dust on them. Um, you know, there's a whole series of these things occurring, and there's um, incredible, incredible information about who run, who ran that organisation, who is subsequently dead. You know, so we have no one to take to court to even ask about it. They're just washing their hands of knowledge. But the fact is, absolute fact is, the White Helmets were trained by the New Zealand. That's in stuff. You know, New Zealand Fire Brigade. They were proud of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find that really worrying, you know, that no one's calling this out. The, the evidence is there. And there's no doubt that OPCW was, was forged and Trump on Syria on false information. And it looks like they convinced, the US administration convinced OPCW to lie. And when they wouldn't lie, they removed them all and put in a new report, which they all said, that's not our report. That's just, what just to wrap this one up, yep. um, is if there's one message you would like to give to our Prime Minister and our government today, what, that, what's that message? Well, the message is, New Zealand has always stood up for the little guy. You know, we always pack a punch above our weight. And we're doing that right now. This is that feel-good story we talked about. We did that when women needed the vote. We did that when women needed to go to university. We did it when there was nuclear weapons and when France was bombing islands. Why are we not calling out the torture, which has been proven by the UN, Mills Melsner, why are we not calling out torture and possibly the end of journalism? Journalists are not reporting on the criminalisation of their own industry. And that is very telling. And what's going to happen is the public are going to just forget mainstream media altogether. And so that silo, or thought silo, is going to get ever, ever decreasing. And all the other silos where we're all activists talking to ourselves, preaching to the converted in our AI algorithm, those are getting bigger. So, you know, I think that they're less and less aware of what the people want, which is really, really frightening. But that's why you're seeing all these horrific political moves around the world, like what's going on in the Democrats' party at the moment in the States. What happened to Corbyn? All those things. You're seeing the people revolting against their governments. And so any anti-establishment candidate is doing really well. So Jacinda... Uh, Please support Julian Assange. We asked for an asylum um, application, well, I know, a year or so ago. And not one MP would stand by what we were doing. We got sponsored by someone who wanted free press. But not one person in there, not Green Party member, not Dolrit. I mean, none of them would stand up and say, yes, this man has been tortured. That's right. Unbelievable. What, what do you believe should happen to Julian Assange? Well, I want him to be safe and I want him to have not been gagged because he's one of the most important anti-war voices we have. Yeah, I mean, he's gagged, he's been tortured, he's been slowly murdered just by his situation and what's going on. He's kept in solitary, it's 10 years without sun. It's ridiculous. New Zealand can't stand for that. Make your voice heard. So now my harimai, welcome to Educating for Social Change on Wellington Access Radio 106.1 FM. Ko Victoria Quaid Aho. Educating for Social Change is brought to you by the Wellington Workers Educational Association and features union and community news, social and political comment and some great music. And we started off today's program with classic Pink Floyd, Wish You Were Here, quite specifically because um, founding member of Pink Floyd, Roger Waters, is one of 
many celebrities who have come out uh, um, in support of Julian Assange, WikiLeaks founder. And um, so uh, the 48-year-old Australian was arrested at uh, um, last year in April uh, at the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where he had been staying since 2012. Assange had sought asylum at uh, the embassy to avoid extradition to Sweden on a rape allegation that he's always denied. And although Swedish prosecutors have, have now dropped the investigation into the 2010 allegations, Assange was sentenced after his arrest to 50 weeks in jail for evading bail at Belmarsh Prison. Um, for for, for beach, breaching his bail conditions. Now, uh, Julian Assange's um, real fear has always been uh, not extradition to Sweden, but extradition to the United States. This appears to have been justified because shortly after his arrest, a case was filed by US authorities for Assange's extradition to the United States. And the first uh, hearing on that uh, extradition um, filing was last week. Joining me in the studio is Alex Hills, who has been a guest on the show before. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, Victoria. Thanks for having us. Thanks um, for me. <laughs> now, um, Alex is part of the global movement to free Julian Assange and uh, also to keep attention on his case. And, um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, there's a, uh, uh, the high-profile high, high profile, um, performers and celebrities like um, Roger Waters, but there's many, many more. There is... Um, Chrissy Hind from The Pretenders. Yeah. Uh, uh, Brian Eno, um, MIA um, rapper and Loki. So, so there's a, there's a, a there's a host <laughs> there's a host of actors, filmmakers, yep. political commentators, um, journalists, all um, supporting um, Assange. Some know him, some don't. Mm -hmm. um, but um, now, um, Alex uh, Assange is being pursued under a, a U.S. indictment on the basis of seventeen charges under the American Espion Espionage yeah. Act um, and one charge under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Mm. These are all related to um, a WikiLeaks publication in 2010 and 11 of several hundred thousand military documents and diplomatic cables that mm. were leaked to WikiLeaks by um, Chelsea Manning. And now the charges that the, the US have filed, I understand they carry a possible combined sentence of... 175 years, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and um, now the publication of those documents by WikiLeaks resulted in extensive media reporting mm. on a series uh, on matters that are indisputably of public interest. Yeah, in fact, Guardian were the ones to release the data, in the, fact, the before Julian was quite ready for it, I think. Um, and, yeah, I mean, there are, the the thing is, it it's now become, it's, it's a decade. It's a landmark case as well. It's like the edge of a cliff stuff. <laughs> now, yeah. um, the, the, the Reporters Without Borders have conducted um, uh, unprecedented international trial monitoring this last week. Um, uh, for his extradition hearing, uh, as both the prosecution and the defence have presented their legal arguments mm. at uh, Woolwich Crown Court in London. Now, um, the, the Reporters Without Borders, or also known by its French acronym of RSF, um, or, uh, Reporters Sans Frontier, ha are concerned about the lack of evidence for the US. Now, this is something that's come up again and again, that um, this is this is overkill. Well, I mean, considering that we now know through El Pay um, and the court case that's going on in Spain, um, that the entirety of his time at the Ecuadorian embassy by a, a Spanish company called UC Global was being spied upon. So they have every single document, also Ecuador, after they um, yanked him out of his asylum, breaking 
you know, I laws guess, laid down in the world wars. When they yanked him out of the asylum, they took all of his paperwork and handed it over to to the US physically as well. So, um, okay, so so that 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 certainly there's a lot of issues mm, involved in here that's sure. um, to do with how much protection do journalists have. I mean, there is a big argument: is Assange a journalist or not? Mm. Um, as I think. I, I err on the side of, well, whether you did a journalist course or not, if you are reporting uh, news that or reporting information that um, um, people don't want you to have because maybe they're engaging in illegal activities, then you're, you're probably your ju- you're doing the job yeah. of journalism. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's won um, over 20 international um, and national awards in Australia. He's been um, six times nominated for Nobel P- Peace Prize. Um <laughs> yeah, so. but what what um, what is it that that is that motivates um, you? I mean, mm. obviously you the injustice of it, and well, yeah, that that's one thing. I mean, I was I was very on board just on on social media during the Bernie days um, when when Hillary was stealing the primaries from Bernie the last time. Um, and I saw a wonderful thing. I saw the youth just completely excited about politics. And I was so happy to see that, that I really jumped on board and I must have got myself in 20 or 30 Bernie groups. So I was well, well okay. in there. But this, but this is Amer- that, the American, American domestic politics. How does this relate? To, well, um, what happened was I saw what happened when the WikiLeaks r- released the information that showed that, that it had just been completely cheated and all those people had been cheated out of their small donations from Bernie. And I really got motivated to look into WikiLeaks. When I looked into WikiLeaks further, I mean, I had known of them, but of course this got me delving further. I could see that there were environmental cover-ups that they had exposed. There was stuff in Russia that they've exposed. There's stuff in America, in England, all around the world. And it, and, and it actually, unfortunately, affects the left and the right, which is why we have such a, a, a ganging up of states against this man. Um, my feeling, anyway. <laughs> Okay. was a, um, a, a comms officer or a, a monitoring officer uh, for American um, uh, intelligence and disturbed by what they um, were, the material that was coming over their desk, um, leaked the material to WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks, of course, had been set up uh, by Julian Assange and others who wanted to... Um, uh, create a safe way for whistleblowers to um, to to get the information uh, that that they felt was in the the public should be in the public domain but wasn't. And uh, as I mentioned um, when I first started talking, is that as a result of these leaks that were were the publication of leaked documents by WikiLeaks uh, in 2010, 2011, um, there was extensive media reporting on uh, actions by of the US in Guantanamo Bay. Uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the the wars that that had been. You know, by two thousand and ten, there'd been um, war action happening in that part of the world for mm. for some time. So. Um, now, you, I've got with me in the studio, uh, I've got Alex Hills, who uh, as said she was first motivated not by actually by WikiLeaks, but by following the, um, following the American, the US uh, political elections, the last, the last ones. Not the ones coming up, but the last ones. And that got her interested in what was WikiLeaks all about, what was the case against mm. Julian Assange. Mm. And um, it... We into, we talked to you, uh, I think now more than a year ago, mm. um, and since then you have been unwavering in <laughs> your um, campaign yeah. to draw attention to the whole Assange case. Yeah, well, I feel New Zealand um, traditionally was a site where we used to stand up for the little guy, to stand up for the people, um, and we, you know, we've we've had a history of you know homosexuality, making that legal, women the right to vote, you know, and it just feels like New Zealand could could step up here, you know, like they did for the anti-nuclear cause or, or, or bombing of Mira Atoll. Um, this, is a pl- this is an opportunity. And what was a bit disappointing
disappointing was that um, the media just seemed to to ignore completely have ignored completely our protests, and we've had a lot of beautiful, peaceful protests and music activism that have hit the world and gone global on Twitter, but. We can we can we couldn't get it reported here, which was a bit disappointing. So so why why do you think uh, it is um, so so difficult to get the 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 case uh, um, or the the issues about Assange uh, out there publicly? Is it is it that that they are there's just too much detail because they're mm. you know ten years on there's a lot of detail. Yeah. Though. Well, I mean, plenty of people have done reports on the detail um but um yeah i mean i think that they're um, i i don't really know i don't know, really know what to say uh, about them it just seems obvious that we need to hold our governments to account here um and, and and you know i i'm i'm trying to fight for my children's free press and if we if we don't have this information being released to the public if our kids can't do this in the future which looks like we're increasingly looking like we're going in that direction um, mainly because of what happened in what has been a show trial for the last week. Um, Julian was handcuffed 11 times, moved into five holding cells, strip search before his trial. He's kept in a glass box. He's not allowed to be with his lawyers. He's not allowed to communicate with his lawyers. Yeah, well, um, as I mentioned before, the um, reporters Sans Frontier, the RSF, um, are very concerned uh, about... Assange's uh, well-being and yes. his inability to participate in his hearing. Yes, um, and he's he's hasn't didn't hasn't taken the stand, uh, and apparently his several attempts to speak from the secure dock in which he's held um, at the back of the courtroom were interrupted by the judge. Um, and told he must speak through his lawyers, but he's not allowed, he's not allowed to, s- to speak through his lawyers. Yeah, but, exactly. But he's not, he's not, in a glass soundproof box and he's complaining yeah. he cannot hear the proceedings. He doesn't even have the documents at the end of the day. It, 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 it's really, we are talking about abuse of legal rights here to the nth degree. It's quite frightening, um, which is why, you know, I really feel that this needs to be reported. But it seems like the media haven't really been reporting it because... The problem is that this information that's been released has, has 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 really embarrassed the media. It's really embarrassed people on the left, and it's really embarrassed people on the right. And unfortunately, that doesn't win you a lot of, you know, fans. Apart from from the people who appreciate this standing up and and speaking truth to power. And I'm sure my kids will in the future if they're still allowed. Okay, well, um, uh, on the fourth day of the extradition hearing in London, um, before the the uh, proceedings were adjourned, um, the his uh, Assange's barrister, uh, Edward Fitzgerald QC, said the motivation motives for publishing confidential information about Guantanamo Bay, Bay and the actions of the U.S. military in Iraq and Afghanistan were political. And this is what it seems to be hinging on, is that the the US, um, uh, whose representatives were present but didn't speak, they they are maintaining that um, it, that it's not political and that it's a case of security. But the- uh, I don't know if that's true, actually. I think they're saying, yes, it is very well political, but we don't care what the fourth um, uh, um, article says in the extradition treaty between the US and UK. And the fourth article says there must not be political extraditions. Yeah. <laughs> now, and, and unfortunately, they're saying that that just doesn't hold. And so their argument, it, 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 it's false. It's okay. completely false, in my opinion. Well, the hearings um, resume in May. Um, yeah, May 18th. May I 18th, yeah. um, when hopefully some evidence will be heard because um, it's uh, uh, RSF says that in the course of the prosecution's <sighs> argument that they haven't really presented any evidence for their claim no. that Assange um, has uh, put sources at serious and imminent risk. And one of the findings actually was that, that, you know, we've already proven in court that no one was hurt or harmed by the WikiLeaks releases that we're talking about. So, you know, the, the, the argument again is false because we, we can't point to any evidence of anyone harmed. Okay, so what's your plans? What's your plans now? Well, You're keeping up the action? Yeah, so, I mean, New Zealand really is, um, is, is packing a punch here uh, and I'd really like people to know about it. Um, Candles for Assange was formed by our free Assange New Zealand group. Um, we uh, invited the world to a birthday vigil back in July. 
um, and that his birthday was the 3rd of July. Um, and um, we, we really didn't expect to have to list too many events. We thought we might get the Five Eyes or something. I've got a few people in, in those countries. Um, but in one week we had, I don't know, 40 or 50, 50 cities and in, by, by the second week, which is all the time that we'd allowed it, we had 62, which was a ph you know, phenomenal response and it just showed you how much the world is, is supporting this certainly, cause that we can't get in the media. <laughs> certainly the scale of, um, uh, of the protests in other places is, is a lot larger than the, the, the 20 or 30 people that uh, um, you're attracting. I'm not really focusing on Wellington. My whole focus has been on um, listing global events from two years ago. That's kind of been always what I've done. And in fact, I've been putting out a call to, for someone to take over the Wellington because it's a bit much for one person to do all the, the world events and all, also Wellington. But there, there are a lot of people in the Free Assange team and there are a lot of people dotted around the country as well. Um, and in fact, there's quite a big group in Auckland. And if you saw their protest, there was a band and they were outside the US consulate on Monday as well. And of course, the wonderful thing about listing the world events for candles for Assange is that we are the first to see the sun um, in the world. So it, it's kind of almost appropriate that we, 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 you know, promote our first event and tell everyone about all the other ones that are about to come up and roll around the world. So we've had a, a, an amazing success with that and also with our music. So, mm. well, yeah. Look, Thank you very much, Alex, for coming in, and <laughs> we're going to go me. go with um, go out with uh, a bit of music. This one is one that um, uh, we'll, we'll take a break with um, a, a, another singer songwriter. This one is um, the this is this is David Rovex, who is a, a radical song songster, and this is um, a, a, a song for Chelsea Manning. Now, sweetheart, you know Bernie and Hillary and the the, yeah, the, yeah. the whole steal the election thing. <laughs> but Do you want me to clarify fair? that now? No, no, because yeah, no. we're talking about a side. But, but this is WikiLeaks release that got me motivated. The first yeah, time. no, no, no I, under, I understand. But but when you are talking to the police, they're yeah. not necessarily going to know. Well, I was going to break into the fact that it just concerns me because I have children <laughs> next door. Okay. But um, yeah. yeah. So, but that um, was the, the, the initial motivator. That so, that so you were following the American elections. Heavily. Yeah, I would have yeah. been one of those but, Russian but so trolls. Just, re just remember that yeah, when you... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to do... I'll do another grab with Alex. Yeah. And then another song. And then I've got time to go to the loo. Yes, you do. You do. And grab yourself a glass for water or whatever. Uh, turn left. I mean, turn right, then it's on your left. Yeah, no, I'll clarify that. Yeah, no, no, I don't think you need to clarify because I think that actually obscures. Okay, it's like the motherhood thing. Yeah, 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 but it's your motivation. Yeah, yeah. But um, now, uh, just tell us a bit about the kind of things. I'm going to ask Handle. you about the kind of things that you've done. Yeah. And um, um, so I'll re I'll rephrase that. Mm -hmm. But um, because. There is um yeah you have it's not that what you say is not true and provable but the amount of time you spend proving it totally distracts from yeah the, I mean there's plenty of documents yeah. in WikiLeaks <laughs> yeah. but they never talk about what actually was in those emails <laughs> yeah but, uh, but it's about um that. Okay, so uh, I think in the context of what's going on now in Bernie and, and how because the MSM had to yeah, apologise. Yeah, yeah. But in 2010, doing. it's the this is related to. But it's not, is it? No, yeah, but it's yeah. like everything, is yeah. it? You know, I mean, it's like consumer capitalism. You know, but how much can you do? There's been a new clause that's been released that's really blown it out the water. Shows that um, yeah. a deal has been made in Ecuador with Grinnell. Quite possibly, but it's the it's the it's if you're going to do this thing, it's what is the concern? Yeah. Is the existence of these background deals? Yeah, yeah. The existence of these things. Yeah. The details of them really doesn't matter because mm -hmm. there's so okay. many of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all you do is like you you bury the story in the details. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Which, I think just because of Bernie having such a momentum at the moment, it's quite exciting. If you don't follow the American elections, who fucks Bernie? Mm. Yep. It doesn't mean anything to you. Yeah. Well, to me, it's yeah. our only government. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, really you had to. And you heard about us not being allowed to collect addresses outside New Zealand Parliament, didn't you? Um, th that is something about your activism, so that we can focus on that. Started, though, I want to mention that we have some really special guests tonight. One that I'm super excited about, Alex J. Hill, a guest from Wellington, New Zealand, and a free speech advocate and longtime Julian Assange activist, will give us a global perspective on the ongoing UK extradition hearing of Julian Assange. She will discuss the global response from journalists, prominent whistleblower advocates, and ordinary people across the globe. And uh, that's super important, super pertinent news right now, and it's not getting a lot of coverage in um, corporate media, so hats off to PNN for uh, bringing this great voice. And we okay, next up, part one of Alex Hills. We've made a formal complaint to Parliament now. Well, that's good. Okay, I think my recorder's working. Thank oh. goodness. Good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. So tell me, what... What are you hearing about the status of the uh, of the hearing? Um, well, I I mean it's been tragic. The sort of um, statements that have been made um, by the prosecution are incredibly worrying. And like everyone is saying, end the show trial. I mean, uh, there's a new protest being called already on the 18th of May, and I'm thinking we need to do one um, 11th April as well because we've got one year since the arrest. So it's quite a significant date. Um, and that gives us a couple of opportunities to do yet another big global protest. But in terms of the case, there's been a really interesting development yesterday. Um, I'm not sure if you picked up on it. It's a little bit in the um, alternate media zone still at the moment. But um, do you know a supporter called Cassandra Rules, Cassandra Fairbanks? Uh, the name rings a bell. I can't quite place it. Yeah, well, she visited Julian in the embassy and she reported back yeah, uh, that that he was kept under the most awful conditions, and while she had a two-hour arrangement at the Ecuadorian embassy in January, um, she got barely eight minutes to talk to him. Um, one of the things that happened, and we've now had a leaked phone call from, which really does suggest absolutely that this is a truthful story. Um, so what happened was that that uh, she was warned, because she used to be in the Trump campaign, she was with a few important people on a DM, including um, Grinnell, Grinnell. Right, right, uh, right. I understand this deal with Ecuador, and um, there's an ABC report which shows that, that he negotiated not to have death penalty, so that Ecuador would release his asylum. Um, and it turns out that Cassandra Fairbanks knew this because of an insider um, who was talking to her on that same chat in Twitter um, and the campaign one and so she went and visited Julian in the embassy and while a uh, radio was on with white noise and they passed notes to each other and face to face with centimeters between them they passed the, she passed the information on that she had that he was going to be um, taken out of the embassy soon and a deal had been made with Ecuador by order of Trump <laughs> And um, and basically that information got to Julian. And as soon as she left the embassy, the person that had given her that information got in touch with her and said, you're revealing classified information. Or she became aware anyway immediately that they knew about that meeting, even though they tried to do it face-to-face, -face, just verbally, in that Ecuadorian embassy. I mean, so it speaks to the fact that it proves that the CIA was spying on them, as 
the El Pay um, court case in Spain is suggesting. Uh, it proves that Trump got vindictive after Dillian refused to um, reveal his source. Um, it proves that then they went on the witch hunt, the arrest happened, and we've had a year of torture and gagging and British prison system. Um, yesterday, or the beginning of the trial, apparently they, they handcuffed him 11 times, they strip searched him three times. I mean, it's absolutely disgusting. I can't actually even hold it together sometimes. It's, it's 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 a disgrace that no that people aren't standing up for this. They don't realise it's their kids free press. Yet. They don't realise. It's just so depressing. But on the other hand, we've got 1,300 journalists, including Hedges, Pilger, Tomsky, uh, Daniel Ellsberg of the Pentagon Papers fame. I mean, we right. have more than 100 doctors speaking out saying he's going to die in British custody if we're not careful, if we don't protect him. We've got Amnesty finally bloody... Two working days before the bloody extradition hearing coming out with a bloody petition. I wonder if it's about money. But anyway, I mean, it's great that Amnesty is supporting him, but I've been a personal um, anti-fan of Amnesty for a long time because of their um, complicity in some of the information that comes to, to, to the narrative for war. Um, yeah, I, I, it is bewildering, but at the same time, I know that their like mainstream media, their old media silo is shrinking and shrinking, and that's why we're seeing them so out of touch with things like Bernie, so out of touch with what people really want. You know, you know one of the things that we find very interesting, you know, uh, stories that pop up and then quickly disappear always have an interesting aspect of them, right? And the story about the offered deal to Julian disappeared after the first notice, and other than the, the alternate press, thing is invisible. And since we know, we know for certain sure that he has made those kind of offers to other people, it's completely in character that he would have yeah. offered this to Julian if he just lied for him. Geez, where have we heard that before, right? And, yeah, I, and I think Dana Robacher has got to be lying, and I've heard other stories about that visit to the embassy, which are very interesting, and I won't repeat them here because I don't know if they're true or not, but it's worth a look into outside of mainstream media, I think. Well, yeah. I, I think we know, and, and there's already been some talk about the spying that was done in the Ecuadorian embassy by a Spanish security firm, and... Yeah. You can only imagine what kind of organizations were getting access to that information and what, you know, uh, we're, we're well, all... I mean, Cassandra Fairbanks' call cool, literally proves that within minutes they knew. They yeah. knew they come, their private conversations face-to-face -face and she was very careful. She knew about how sensitive that... And he's her friend, you know, she's a journalist, but I believe, you know, that he's a, he, he and her are very close friends. Good. Um, couldn't keep that information from him, um, and I'm really glad that she's blown the whistle now. And if you look at her uh, Cassandra rule, you'll see her um, video on it, which is actually quite frightening for all supporters. I mean, we've got a situation where a Trump um, appointee is bullying um, this, this this journalist, and um, it's frightening actually to hear she talks about torture being mentioned in the same sentence as her eight-year-old child. It's a real worry, and this is Trump fully, you know, what, he, he didn't get his way, and we're just seeing him throwing his toys out the court. And I don't think he's going to win this, but the hearts and minds of the people, as soon as they're informed of the truth, it, it, it's just clear. The truth is going to come out in the end. So one day, <laughs> these war criminals are going to pay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that was part one with uh, Alex Hills of uh, New Zealand, and here is part two. What is the name of the organization, or is there a formal organization of some kind that you work with to try to get the word out about uh, Mr. Assange? Well, um, I, I think I did speak about it last time, but it's really developed since then. Um, if you remember, we held that 62 City protest, um, which Wellington invited the world to a birthday vigil for free press, and uh, a staggering 62 cities joined us. And uh, it kind of came off the back of a, a, a viral candle display, which we've done the previous year for his 47th birthday, where we mentioned candles for Assange. And so basically, um, once we instigated that movement, we had then these wonderful connections, just one or two people in pretty much every one of those cities. 
And so we had this ideal opportunity to kind of unite all these different supporting groups and try and get them working toward one day and doing solidarity actions. And the purpose was, um, we really wanted to back up the, the official WikiLeaks um, campaign in London that was going on, which is called BEA campaign on Twitter, Vote Expedite Assange. Um, their campaign was endorsed by um, WikiLeaks, and so we wanted to hold global solidarity actions. It didn't matter how small, but just as many as possible around the world so that we can give out some pamphlets, hold some music. We had a jam for Julian, which I think is going on today, actually, or tomorrow um, in the States. Um, and so, yeah, the, this movement that was born in New Zealand went completely mental in Germany. And now we have a situation where 25 cities in Germany are holding either weekly or fortnightly protests um, to free Assange. We have ones in Vienna now, we have ones in Brussels, we have ones in New York. New York actually were the first to do it, I think. New, to be fair credit, New, uh, NYC Free Assange mentioned that they started doing weekly vigils almost from the arrest. So they've been doing it a little bit longer than us. But we got on board and just tried to get as many cities doing it as possible. And I think we've got, last count, about 35, of which 25 are in Germany. So that campaign went completely mad again, and we did 34 cities on Monday for the marking of the beginning of the extradition trial. Um, but also during the week, we managed to list about, um, nothing to do with instigating it, but um, managed to list over 120 events, you know, in probably about five continents and 25 countries, something like that. Incredible. Um, support. And it's really, it's not really any organization, it's just it's all coming together and trying to connect a little bit and, and I'm helping promote it as much as possible once I get some city on board I try and get others to help share their um, pictures from the event or their adverts for the next one you know you have stood up for freedom of speech you've stood up for fair play and justice for Mr. Assange for quite some time now you've, you're a musician and uh, also a landscape architect if I remember correctly uh, I'm an architect actually, a British architect Okay. But, um, in New Zealand, I just work as a licensed building practitioner. I do small jobs from the home, which is what allows me to comment. I mean, having my own little business where I'm not really afraid of losing work. Um, <laughs> so your, 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 employer, your employer approves, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, I did work at uni first when I came to, to, to Wellington. I worked at Victoria University. I published a paper, actually, in um, Taylor and Francis, and that's something I wouldn't mind bringing up. Um, Please do tell us um, about it. Yeah, well, um, do you know about the OPCW leak, I presume? No, I don't. Oh my god, okay. So, um, WikiLeaks um, released probably about six weeks ago now, I'm thinking, um, the OPCW leaks. What they are is weapons of mass destruction in Syria. So, the fake narrative that gave Trump the excuse to bomb. Um, Syria, whether he knew or not, he did bomb it, um, and this was the claim that Assad gassed his own people. Now, um, several, a handful of UN um, engineers, inspectors, medical professionals, um, specialists in chemicals, they went to the site, they reported back and they said, this didn't happen, this was a staged event, there was no chlorine above background levels. Right. Um, the hole in the roof where this canister is meant to have come down isn't big enough for the canister, and the canister shows no marks of making that hole. Um, basically, they they said the 40 people dead did not die from um, any kind of gas attack here, and it looks more likely that they were gassed in some kind of space and then placed on the site. Now, the really scary thing about that is that the most likely culprit um, of placing and, and creating those photos were the white helmets. Oscar winning, good Clooney, Oscar winning, US, UK, France, at New Zealand Fire Brigade trained so called Syrian um, rescue forces. Now, if you look at Eva Bartlett, if you look at 21st Century Wire, if you look at pretty much any um, grey zone, any, any kind of decent news outlet, they're covering this. But you're not seeing it anywhere in... Oh, in, God, in no. Fact, a Newsweek article, a Newsweek author, Harry, um, was, was, was sacked because he tried to bring the story out. Um, so, 
really appalling, um, appalling kind of situation there with the OPCW. Now, the, the reason I was telling you that, and I'm now having to go back to what we were talking about before. Oh, oh my God, I've lost that frame. But if I think about it, sure. oh, something comes to it. I've had about, um, because of all this listing, 120 events, I've had about... Um, and let me let me add here. Four, there, uh, four days. <laughs> you're a hardworking person, and also not only a professional uh, architect and designer, you're also an extraordinary musician, and you've done many concerts yourself. And I've heard some of your really beautiful violin playing. Um, why don't you talk just a little bit about some of the concerts you've done to raise awareness of, of Mr. Assange's play? Um, well, yeah, music for Assange, violinist for Assange, a lot of viral tweets. Where it all came from, possibly what really got me standing up and getting on the street for this in the first place was Alex Taylor. Um, now, he is the violinist in London. He's actually an Australian, um, and he has made it into MSM because he was playing his violin on Australia Day outside the Ecuadorian Embassy a good long time ago, uh, Australia Day is January 26th. Uh, um, and so he was playing um, Welcome Matilda in a sort of sarcastic manner outside Julian's room. And he got pulled off the street by the armed <laughs> violence. Committing music, huh? Yeah, committing music on Australia Day and being sarky, yeah. Um, so anyway, I saw that and I thought, gosh, I can, I, I can play the violin. I can, I can make a scene with my violin too. And what's interesting about it, and it's interesting about the candles, Assange kind of movement as well as it's inherently peaceful. Candle vigils are very hard to make look fascist or violent. <laughs> Music is very hard to make look fascist or violent. I mean, violin, even when I was playing, I don't know if you've seen that clip where I'm playing in the face of the um, policeman who'd interrupted our protest and was talking to a random protester and I wanted him to wait until I could talk to him as the organiser. And I wasn't willing to stop my song, so I played in his face and really gave it to him. But um, it's a violin, so it cannot be construed as being violent. So it's less easy to come into the movement, like what happened with Occupy and so many other, you know, TV, uh, yellow vests now in certain countries. You know, it's made to look violent by certain acts occurring that make it look violent that actually weren't perpetrated by the people. And this is a common problem for activists everywhere, I believe. Um, at least I'm seeing that. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, his inspiration led me to get into violining myself. I did a few kind of fun things with hula hoops and playing the American anthem outside the American embassy and then waltzing Matilda outside the... You know, while I was hula hooping, I was playing violin. <laughs> um, just making a spectacle of myself, really, to to make the most ridiculous image that might share, that just might get word out because it's a bit crazy. Now, if I'm not yeah. mistaken, I think I heard that some Australian official has begun to side with Assange, begun to request his extradition to Australia. Is that the case? That's right. Well, more than one. We've got 14 members of a cross-party working group of, and 20, I believe, that support it as well, in addition, within the Australian Parliament. So things are looking good. Um, not as good as some other um, governments. I mean, even Norway, which has nothing to do with um, Assange, essentially, has, has uh, well, it has a little bit too, but um, they, they've come out with a statement. I'm just trying to find an English version of it at the moment to share, but that's brand new news. I mean, so many parliaments are standing up. Geneva's offered him um, asylum, you know. We've got... Why is Australia, and Maurice Payne specifically, ScoMo, uh, as we call him, I think it's cool for him to be, <laughs> to get rid of him, the Prime Minister. But, um, yeah, why, why is it that, that Australia, who actually, you know... They, they, he belongs to Australia. He is a hero to millions of people around the world and a journalist and a Nobel, six times Nobel Peace Prize nominee. Um, it's incredible that Australia won't stand up for him. It's embarrassing. I mean, I've got an Australian, um, an English and, and a Kiwi passport and I have many times thought about burning a couple of them, actually. I mean, not that New Zealand is that much better either. We've tried very hard here and New Zealand needs to stand up for things but we can't even get it in the media here that this little movement handles for Assange just become global and <laughs> just it's pretty sad. Um, also our um, chief 
investigative journalist Nikki Hager was actually the second person in charge of that um, list of hundred journalists that signed a statement for Assange, you know, that included Hedges and Elsberg, um, Pilger, all those wonderful names. Um, so he, he's actually instrumental in that, in gathering those people um, and putting that statement out. And yet New Zealand media has not covered it. But what they have covered is a Mike Hosking smear today or yesterday, which was so appalling. I have been attacking his timeline. <laughs> what can you do? Let me um, ask you what, one more question, if I may. Um, this uh, extradition hearing, uh, is there an estimated guess when this is going to be completed? Is it going to go through the weekend? Is it going to continue next week? Or are they expecting a ruling on Friday? Well, I understand that this has been a week of trial and the next one is going to come up on, on the 18th of May, which is why that's the next global um, protest that's been called out for um, stop show trial. Okay. Um, this is what so many academics and politicians, even uh, uh, you know, journalists, everyone is saying now. I mean, there's still a few journalists holding on to their smears and their sweeping and all the rubbish that, that has been propagated about this case. Um, and they they are becoming a shrinking silo, a shrinking sports silo. It kind of amuses me that, that, that the establishment put us all into sports silos where we sort of preach to the converted and actors all talk to each other and it's hard to get the message out of our little silos. But did they ever did it ever occur to them that they put themselves in a silo as well? Of course not. They put themselves in a silo. And that silo isn't increasing. It is decreasing, and they're becoming increasingly out of touch with people, as evidenced by Bernie. I just, I just think it's so obvious that the AI has backfired on them. You know, it, it's so unfortunate, and you point to a really important, uh, if you will, trend that more and more people listen to a narrower and narrower range of information. And when that happens, that is clearly a recipe for, for misjudgment. Because if you don't hear a range of opinion, if you don't hear a range of information, then basically you're at the mercy of whatever propaganda you're being bathed in. And uh, we all know the problem with that. I mean, just look at Russia Gate for the sure. last three years, then followed by Ukraine Gate. We've, we've had such a joke. I mean, when, when the Democrats could have been fighting Trump on war crimes, on so many abuses of, of you know, food stamps, of, of, you know, things that he didn't do that he said he was going to do coming out of war. There's so many ways to get him, and yet they, they persisted on getting him on something that showed more corruption on their side than anything. Uh, unfortunately, there are those that would rather have him there as an enemy than, <laughs> than help the people in their need. Uh, yes. Alex. I've heard that MSNBC has been apologizing for yeah. their because it's had so much backlash. Yeah, and and uh, one of the uh, one of the known propagandists for the extreme right basically just sabotaged uh, two different reporters on ABC, and ABC's taken them off the air. It, it's a real shame. And I thank you for the good work that you're doing, not because it puts a penny in your pocket, but because you're standing for truth. You're standing for someone who's a freedom fighter and how that is not the common cause of every liberation-oriented person on the planet, I don't understand. But I want to uh, think... Well, overarches everything, doesn't it? It really does. Overarches every concern you might have about our government and how things are going. <laughs> well, you know, clearly Mr. Assange and, and Miss Manning have, have, been, have been vilified and have ended up paying the price of the lies that our governments have been portraying. And I thank you for the freedom work that you're doing. Alex, it's an honor to know you and call you friend. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. My pleasure. Talk to you soon, okay? And Bye-bye. anytime I can do some more good for you and get you on the mic, I'm honored to do that, okay? Yeah, just please share away, and I hope you're a member of our Candles for Assange group. We've got uh, lots of action going on in there. It's incredible. I'll send you pictures. Thank you so much. Okay, cheers. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye.
is is the mastermind behind Candles for Assange. Can you tell us a little bit about why you started Candles for Assange and how you're yeah. keeping track? Because there are just so many events happening today yeah. specifically, but it kind of started uh, around Julian's birthday. Well, it actually officially started his 47th birthday. Uh, we, me and Greg, who's speaking in the moment behind us, me and Greg decided that um, a petition, an emergency, very quick fire petition to the parliament to ask for New Zealand to offer Julian asylum here. Because New Zealand traditionally used to stand up for the little guy. You know, if you think about women's right to vote, women in university, um, homosexuality being legalized, we talk about nuclear uh, protests and protesting the French bombing. You know, New Zealand always were these people that stood up, and that's why I was quite proud. I'm British, Australian, and Kiwi, and I was really delighted to be able to move here because I've got very low respect for Australia and Britain at the moment. In fact, I'm on the edge of wanting to burn my two passports. But, I mean, New Zealand was a little bit disappointing too because the whole reason I originally got into it was I saw no one was doing a protest here, and that's why I had to step up. Yeah. Um, but basically what happened is on his 47th birthday, we announced that we were going to start this asylum petition. And just over there, there's a viral image you might remember in front of the beehive of candles saying free Assange. Well, we got well known for that. So we got a little bit of a position. So the following year, we just said, oh, we're going to do the same thing again. Only this time at the US Embassy. Please, world, join us for a free press protest on Julian's birthday, a birthday vigil, candles for Assange, hashtag. And basically, it went completely mental. I think there was only like two and a half weeks from when I said that to the yes. event. And within a week, it was 50 cities. And within two weeks, it was 62. Um, and I was completely overwhelmed and also sleepless nights, a bit like the last few days, trying to kind of feel like I can't let it down. Now I've said I'm going to do it. There's so many events coming and I'm going to have to try and list them somehow and keep on top of it. But it has been a challenge to do that because, of course, there's lots of easy mistakes to make and you don't really understand some of the languages so yeah. yes I understand that yeah and you <laughs> you are a musician who has used music as a form yeah. of your activism can you tell us yeah I know you've been a guest before and we've talked about this and you've played on our show but can you yeah. talk again about why um, you incorporated your music into activism for Julian Assange well I just had someone come up and tell me that Julian Assange is the new Nelson Mandela open and shut case you know and if we think about how Nelson Mandela got freed, I think that music played an amazing role, role in that, don't you? Um, Definitely. You know, we, we, we all remember that song, Free, you know, Nelson Mandela. We tried to sing it yesterday, actually, with uh, Julian Assange. But yeah, so that, we've got that. We've got Band-Aid. We've got um, music. What it does is it makes you inherently look peaceful. It's very hard to corrupt a candle display. It's very hard to make it look like we're violent if I've got a violin out. Um, even if I was intimidating that policeman that time playing right in his face, it was only because he was interrupting us. And it was difficult for him to get angry at me because I'm playing a violin. So you've got a kind of a little bit more of a poetic life, whereas most protesters find that they eventually get corrupted with someone who wants to be violent and, and cause problems to the movement. But somehow the music and the candles, it just keeps it the peaceful vibe. It keeps it, we're not trying to make any trouble with just trying to inform people um, and yeah I think music has the power to heal um, and it has the power to cut through to people who wouldn't normally be exposed to that message yeah, yeah so. and and one of your songs that you played in pubs uh, politics in the pub last year yeah. um, Christine Assange actually sent to Julian and he got to see that uh, well yes that's an interesting story because the reason that I thought suddenly that I could be more powerful than I was just sharing stuff on social media. It's because I saw Alex Taylor um, in London, obscure he is on Twitter. Um, I saw Alex Taylor with a violin being arrested outside the Ecuadorian embassy on Australia yeah. Day. He's Australian and his violin, I think temporarily confiscated from the armed task force. And when I saw that and it went through the entire mainstream media because it was so outrageous, I thought, my God, I, I can play violin. I could, I could use my violin to get through, maybe just doing some crazy stuff with my violin. And, and then my best friend and I are quite musical, and he, he and I came up with that song one day, and, and literally we jammed it out and put it on Unity 4J, the very first yeah. time of the market, playing the jam. That, that, that was a, that an amazing well. song. Yeah, so anyway, Alex Taylor, he wrote a song uh, with his 
violin and a beautiful singer called Maria Milwaki. I don't know how to possibly pronounce it. She's got a beautiful, haunting voice. And we produced a song called Let the Light In. It was a kind of Christmas edition WikiLeaks release. And it went nuts. I mean, yes. like, I don't know how many people, but uh, really great. And yeah, so I was playing Wilson Matilda at that pub. So it wasn't my song, but it was kind of a homage both to Alex Taylor for what he did and stood for, but also, you know, a message to Julian, of course. And I was really? absolutely overwhelmed that Christine wanted to send that to him. So I think, you know, I feel like if he did get that USB stick before when he was in the embassy, he might might have been one of the last things he got to see before. It's true. Um, yeah. yeah, and your That's song, Let the Light In. Personally, is a, is a, an amazing kind of life moment. I, mean, I kind of think I broke down in tears when I saw that tweet. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, but, your song, Let the Light In, was a, a huge hit, um, not only for people that were following Unity for Jay at the time, but it just seemed to really touch a lot of people in the movement. Yeah, and, and Kathy really Bogan, she, yeah, she saw it and she, I had done a sort of mediocre job of a, of a video edit. It was really one of my first ones. Um, and Kathy Vogan loved the song so much. And my second violin part from New Zealand, we called it the uh, Trans Hemisphere Violin Duet. Um, but yeah, so she loved it so much that she, uh, as an academic in film, made a really beautiful recut of it. And she used bits of my stuff too, but she yeah. just kind of made it better. <laughs> Lovely. Well, Alex yeah. Hill, I will let you get back to your event. Thank you, Thank you so much for joining us. For no letting worries. Us Thank you for and, and, and You're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and everybody, we are going to be streaming um, as many events as we can this evening and into tomorrow. Uh, Andrew Smith, Steve Poikinen, and myself, Christy Doff, we will be in D.C. We're starting out at the White House and we're going to march to the DOJ. Um, Yay. So if, you, if you are in the D.C. area, come on down and join us. We're going to start off at noon tomorrow. Um, and then we will be streaming and working with Taylor Hudak, who is in London, covering the events. Um, so yeah, Alex Hill, thanks so much. And if you have any last no words, problem. just let us know where we can follow you and um, oh, yeah. anything else. Okay, so my main Twitter account is Greenweaver Arch, because that's my business, believe it or not. That wasn't meant to be an active business account. Um, but the, the ones I'm using the most for the campaign now are Candles for Assange, the number, Candles for Assange. I've actually just started rat bags for Assange, just as a little personal joke. But um, uh, yeah, and then uh, on, on on Facebook, I'm Alex Hills. And on YouTube, I'm Alex Hills. And there's a whole bunch of music. I did a rogue speech in Parliament for the World Press Freedom Breakfast on 3rd of May. And that was a bit of a coup too, because I don't think the British High Commissioner was, was expecting that. And uh, it was quite a nice panel of people. So um, yeah, OK, I'm talking too much. <laughs> no, you're fine. Thank you so much. Have okay. a great action and have a great day. Thank you so much for what you do again. Yeah, cheers. Can you tell me what, what on earth that came out of? Um, sorry? Um, well, I understand from what um, Alex said that um, that you weren't allowed to click on the That's oh, public yeah, it's, ground, that's public space. This, Space belongs to Parliament yeah. and on behalf and, and the New of Zealand the, people. Yeah, the whole and building New, does yeah, and the, everything the whole does. New Zealand but that people. doesn't mean yeah. you can particularly go into the Prime Minister's office, although she belongs to the people. Yeah, but, so but because can, this you're, is you're, there's nothing stopping you collecting signatures out yeah, there. Yeah, it, and, 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 why? why you, where, where does it say the can you can, so be, can and, um, that this is totally new because right, yeah. I'm, I'm, I've, I've been active in campaigns for 50 years and I've never ever 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 heard, heard of that. Um, and I was also, you know, a Green Party regional councillor for nine years, and I, 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 I don't, you know, can you tell me where you, where, where, where this come from? Who, who, who's that made that, that, um, that? Come from the speakers of the speaker of parliament. So the speaker of the parliament, and when did he issue that decree? It's been years and years. Oh, you that, you're not allowed to collect signatures yes, on, yes. on parliament grounds. The, then you understand why. You don't have to agree, of course. It's your right not to agree. Um, you see, this parliament belongs to everyone. Yeah. And if you start allowing people to collect signatures of your comfort from one particular organisation, 
it means your it means people on Parliament are seen to be promoting one particular thing, whereas the people for everyone, everyone has their own views. That, 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 so that, 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 to avoid that, 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 so you can go outside the Parliament grounds on the road and do it. That's fine. But I can, I can. Yeah, I, I don't seem free to say to me. But that reasoning behind it just seems completely irrational. Um, it's because so that it, everyone it, it's is actually a, a petition is giving voice to the people, and, even, and you can have multiple petitions. You could have one doing one side, and one doing another side, and, and it's a free. Then what will happen if people start getting? Well, in New and Zealand, then you have uh, well, New issues. Zealand, no, well, well, New Zealand, we, so to avoid we that, people are, um, are more respectful of each other. Fortunately, we haven't had. Had, had, had this sort of war, um, only extremists like this guy that's in Christchurch, but, but, but that is not an, um, behavior actually, from 99 I've been here two years and I've seen police having to break up here because two people had opposing views. So it's. Yeah, yeah, you but, but, but you, always can, you always can have two. So that's two the reason people behind that, that. But, but, but that, that, that's not. Yeah. Um, I mean, if, if some people are fighting, then obviously you, ne you need police to, or somebody to intervene to stop it. Right. I mean, that's not the you could right always way, write way to the done. speaker and ask why this is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. certainly will. Yeah. Alex, you're self-interested. Yeah. 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 Y
protecting all that dodgy skin. That's oh, public yeah, ground, that's public space. This space belongs to Parliament yeah. and on and, behalf and the New of Zealand the country people. Yeah, the whole building does yeah, and everything does. But people. that doesn't mean yeah. you can particularly go into the Prime Minister's office, although she belongs to the people. Yeah. But, so but because you can, this you're, is you're, there's nothing stopping you collecting signatures out yeah, there, yeah, yeah, is it? Why are you where, where, where does it say the community can, you, can, so you, can um, that This is totally new because right, yeah. I'm, I'm, I've, I've been active in campaigns for 50 years. And I've um, never ever 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 heard of that. Um, and I was also you know, a Green Party regional council for nine years and I, 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 I don't you know, can you tell me where you where where, where that's come from? Who, who who's that made that that um that it comes from the speakers of the speaker of parliament. So the speaker of the parliament and when did he issue that decree? Years and years, you can look that, that you're not allowed to collect signatures on, yes. on parliament yes. ground. Then you understand why. You don't have to agree, of course. It's your right not to agree. Um, you see, this parliament belongs to everyone. Yeah. And if you start allowing people to collect signatures of your pamphlet from one particular organisation, it means your it means people on parliament are seen to be promoting one particular thing. There's the people for everyone. Everyone has their own views. That, 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 so see, to that, avoid that, 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 so you can go outside the parliament grounds on the road and do it. That's fine. But I can't. I can't. Yeah, I, I, that seems pretty bizarre to me. That reasoning behind it just seems completely irrational. 
Um, it's because so that it, everyone it, is it's actually a, a petition is giving voice to the people, and, even, and you can have it, multiple petitions. You could have one doing one side, and one doing another side, and, and it's a free. Then what will happen if people start getting? Well, in New and Zealand, then you have uh, well, New issues. Zealand, well, well, New Zealand, we, so to avoid we that, people um, are more respectful of each other. Fortunately, we haven't had 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 the sort of war. Um, only extremists like this guy that's in Christchurch. But but that is not an, um, behaviour from 1999. I've been here two years, and I've seen police having to break up here because two people had opposing views. So it's yeah yeah. You, but, but, but but you always can you always can have two. So that's two the reason behind that. that. But, but, but that, that that's not. Yeah. Um, I mean, if if some people are fighting, then obviously you ne you need police to or somebody to intervene to stop. You could that. always write. I mean, that, that's not the right way. You could always write to the speaker done. and ask why this is. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. certainly will. Yeah. Alex, you're self I went in there. I one of them, but um, that, that's totally irrational. That they you can't, the speaker sets the laws, and we should have looked at the piece of paper that the speaker gave us. Well, I don't know who they gave the paper to, but I...
and he had to stow himself away. He had to take extreme caution, cause they were very strong. But they had to let him be in the Ecuadorian embassy. They had to let him be in the Ecuadorian embassy. He exposed them. When protecting their war machine No, they don't care for democracy When protecting all their dodgy schemes Happy birthday, Chelsea! 
say, Chelsea? Really sorry. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Woo! Yes! <laughs> Come here. It's fun. Yes!